Welcome to our webinar, Lifecycle Impacts and Third-Party Certification. This is the third and final webinar in our series, Safe Products Made Safely, Green Chemistry Tools for Business. I'm Kathleen Schuler with the Institute for Agriculture and Trade Policy. Before we get started with the webinar, I just want to remind you of a few technical issues. Um, first, please note that calling into the webinar is recommended for better sound quality rather than using your computer speakers. The call-in number and audio pin should be on your screen. Participants will remain muted throughout the webinar, but you may submit questions at any time during the webinar. Please submit your questions in the question box to the right of your screen. We'll try to answer as many questions as time allows after we hear from our speakers. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on IATP.org. ITP is partnering with Lancaster Cherry and the Great Lakes Green Chemistry Network in hosting this webinar series. The series is part of a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative project to conduct business trainings on green chemistry tools. We are pleased to welcome today's speakers, Lynn Olson and Ben Bezark. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to thank the webinar series co-sponsors in addition to IATP and the Great Lakes Green Chemistry Network. Sponsors include the American Sustainable Business Council, Clean Production Action, the Minnesota Green Chemistry Forum, and the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Today's topic, um, Life Cycle Impacts, and if you notice, we, we changed the title a little bit. Uh, originally, it was Life Cycle Assessment, and we thought impacts was a little bit more accurate, and um, when you hear from Ben and Lynn, you'll understand why. Um, and third-party certification. So both of these topics um, highlight two big issues that companies are grappling with. Lynn Olson will describe the many third-party certification programs that are out there and how Ecolab has navigated this complex area. Ben Bezark will highlight the tools and programs available through the Cradle to Cradle program to support businesses in their green chemistry and sustainable business practices. My introductions will be brief um, as we have a complete speaker bios um, available on our website. So our first speaker will be Dr. Lynn Olson. She's the Senior Program Leader of the Corporate Sustainability Initiative at Ecolab. She has over 20 years experience at Ecolab where she has managed both the laundry product development and the corporate technical services team and holds several individual and team patents. Lynn, um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kathleen, and good afternoon to everybody. I think you should be able to see my screen now. Um, so uh, this gives an overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, this is um, going to be, I should note, a INI, or an institutional industrial uh, perspective since that Ecolab business. Um, so from that perspective, I'll be talking about the certification landscape, um, what we see as market drivers for eco-certification, um, limitations of eco-certifications from our perspective. Um, I'll share with you a bit about our strategy and um, just um, kind of brainstorming what might be beyond eco-certification. So this slide um, shows kind of a landscape um, divided into three different buckets um, that um, are certifications that support our businesses. Um, so on the far left, you see the product level certifications that are really regulatory requirements, like uh, EPA uh, registered disinfectants and sanitizers, making sure that your reach compliant, uh, your ingredients are GRAS approved, etc. Um, the second bucket is um, again product level certifications, uh, but instead of a regulatory requirement, they're more of a business requirement. So um, many contracts and customers really require, you know, NSF or Energy Star, uh, Kosher, Halal. Um, and this is a bucket that I put the eco-certifications in. And here I've circled um, some U.S. eco-certifications like Green Seal and um, U.S. EPA is designed for the environment, and some European, uh, Nordic Swan, uh, and the EU cert, or EU flower. Um, so that's the bucket that these eco-certifications that we'll talk about today fit into. 
Uh, but there's a third bucket that I wanted to mention, um, which is getting quite active, uh, and that's for a uh, facility level certification. And I've uh, divided those into two parts. Uh, the top is what I've labeled internal or um, operation certification. So as an example, uh, many Ecolab plants are ISO 14001 certified or responsible care certified for um, environmental health and safety of operating those plants. Uh, the next set is um, an external certification, and I call them external because for the most part, um, this is what our customers, um, Ecolab customers, would be getting. So we have customers getting LEED certification for their building. In Asia Pacific, uh, we have customers getting EarthCheck certification for their hospitality and uh, tourism properties, um, and same thing with Greenfield. Now that said, um, Ecolab Research Center here in St. Paul, uh, portions of it are also LEED certified. So it is both the internal and external certification. So next, um, digging a little bit deeper, um, you know, what exactly are eco-certifications? And so I have this slide with the definition that um, they're basically product-focused standards that focus on environmental, human health, and safety attributes. Um, they're uh, voluntary, um, and basically it's a process where a evaluating organization um, if it determines if um, your product meets the defined standard and it can be audited. Um, a lot of people use eco-certification and eco-labels um, interchangeably and it makes sense because uh, most eco-certifications have an associated um, graphic logo or label that um, uh, can be used on product collateral on a, or on a product label to indicate that that product has met the standard. Um, the table in uh, the lower right um, kind of gives an overview of the certifications that um, are most relevant today to our business. Um, and I thought it was kind of interesting exercise to uh, look at when they were established, um, the key regions that um, they apply to, because it's an important point that eco-certifications aren't global, they are very regional. Um, so if you have a global business, uh, you have to have a potpourri of eco-certifications to support that business. Um, then I have the certification um, name and then the type. And you'll notice that um, most of the certifications are um, government-based, uh, even though they're not a regula regulatory requirement, um, they're associated with the government except for Greenfield. So going to the next slide, um, you know, that said, I, I showed a small subset, but um, there's a lot of eco-certifications and eco-labels. And um, this is probably a year old or so, but uh, the last time I looked, um, there were 435 uh, labels uh, relevant to 197 countries and covering uh, 25 industry sectors. So. Um, you know, there are many types of eco-labels -label, for many different applications. Um, so ISO, the International Standards Organization, has um, categorized labels into three types. Uh, there's a type one, which is multi-attribute label uh, developed by a third party, and that's most of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, type two is a single attribute uh, developed by the producer or manufacturer themselves. And a type three is a, a, a full uh, life cycle assessment related label. Um, so again, we'll focus on type one. And um, digging a little bit deeper, um, I showed a subset of the labels that um, have been relevant to our business currently. And um, so most of those are type one uh, multi-attribute eco-labels. I have listed here Greenfield, the Nordic eco-label, the Korean eco-label, and uh, the EU CERT. Uh, the EPA design for the environment is um, modeled after type one, but it's a little uh, different because it's more of a partnership. Um, and so there are some differences with how they make changes and get stakeholder input. So that's why I have it um, listed in a bullet below as a subset. Uh, the other relevant um, certifications that I uh, listed were the USDA bio preferred, and that doesn't fall into a type one uh, eco label uh, because it is a third party, uh, but it is uni or one dimensional and it's uh, focused on uh, 
the percent uh, bio-based composition of product, and it's basically uh, driven um, by the U.S. government and the Farm Bill to encourage uh, use of more renewable resources. And then the last one that I mentioned is the LEED or building certification. Um, and that is um, around uh, existing building and new construction uh, following a uh, guidance document and getting points uh, for uh, and different certification levels for your building or your existing building operation. Um, so that's kind of um, classifying the different certifications as an example. So to um, get even more specific, we're kind of drilling down one slide by slide here. Um, at Ecolab, we have um, interact with eco certifications in a couple ways, and so I tried to um, make this really visual so it would be easy to understand. Um, so at the top, I have the left, uh, maybe a set of hard surface cleaning products that Ecolab would get eco certified by, you know, a body like, for example, Green Steel. And that uh, would be used by a customer that maybe the customer was getting a LEED certification. Um, so uh, by purchasing the eco-certified products, um, they can get some points uh, toward their LEED certification. Um, but this is often confusing for a lot of people because they think um, that, they, and we get customers asking questions, do you have any LEED certified products? And if no, if you look in the standard, the LEED standard um, is, um, specifies um, the purchasing of sustainable products, um, which uh, then they specify uh, certain uh, eco-certification uh, options for meeting that requirement for indoor environmental quality. Um, so that's the top examples where Ecolab would get a product certified. Um, now the bottom example is a little bit different. Um, so we also provide products to paper manufacturers. So uh, the beautiful picture of donuts on a paper plate, which the paper plate can't see too well. Uh, a lot of the paper manufacturers will get um, certifications for food contact paper. And um, as part of that, we help our customers get their eco-certification uh, by uh, disclosing uh, certain attributes of our product. So this is a case where um, we don't get our product certified, but we help uh, through providing our customer information and them getting their product, like the paper plate certified. Um, so going to the next subject, so that's kind of the landscape and definition of eco-certification. Uh, the next is, you know, what are the drivers on the market today that we see for eco-certification? So I have uh, three bands here, and these are um, not necessarily in order of um, importance. Um, but the first is uh, corporate initiative. Um, so many of our corporate customers are um, really focused on sustainability. You know, more than 80% uh, have a sustainability leader identified in their organization. Uh, many have, um, you know, part of the carbon disclosure project, um, report their water and energy goals, and um, more and more are um, stating publicly GHG goals and waste goals. And then sometimes as part of their initiative, um, they will incorporate eco-certifications into their strategy. So, so that is a, certainly a driver for eco-certification. Another key driver is the executive order. Uh, so um, the presidents have said, um, you know, we need to, um, as government agencies, encourage environmentally preferable purchasing and uh, give them some guidance that um, you can uh, meet this requirement by getting eco-certification. So that's certainly a driver. Um, the last one I've listed here is LEED, and um, we've talked about the LEED certification. It's a, it's a certification that many of our customers get, and um, that's been growing quite a bit because of uh, LEED volume. So, for example, a um, rest of McDonald's could define and get a um, prototype of a restaurant LEED certified, and then uh, put up millions, not millions, uh, many of those around the country, and um, they would use the same products and use the same design that um, had been certified. So that um, significantly increased, the lead volume significantly could increase the number of um, lead certified buildings around the country. 
Uh, so to get a little bit uh, more specific about the growth of LEED, um, the graph in the upper right-hand corner, um, the dark blue, shows the um, current, as, current as of 2011 um, existing building certified. But at that point in time, there was many, many more registrations in process. So that means that a, a project had been started and was um, underway. Um, so you can see on the left, um, there's kind of a scorecard of the possible points. And this is for um, the lead three, because I think lead four has just come out. Um, so you can um, get lead point uh, for indoor environmental quality. Um, and it's directly related to uh, the percentage of uh, purchase of sustainable cleaning products, for example. So uh, it's if you're you know, trying to get your property LEED certified, you know, why wouldn't you want to just say, hey, I'm going to buy some eco-certified products and, and get those points. So um, that's been a pre pretty significant driver for eco-certification. And um, so as a result of these drivers, you can see that um, you know, both Greensdale and DFE have um, listed the number of certified products on their website. So I, I just um, you know, took a point in time and took those numbers, and um, you can see that you know, in the last uh, ten or so years, there's been a significant increase in the number of eco-certified products available on the market. So, as kind of a, a recap um, of those few slides, the uh, market drivers are corporate sustainability initiatives, uh, government mandates, or the executive order and uh, the pretty significant growth of league. Uh, but in addition to those drivers, um, uh, a key issue we think is that sustainability is complex. It's um, not an easy story to tell. And so uh, we see it as um, solving a, a complicated problem for our customers. Uh, it also shifts the responsibility for evaluating these complex you know, human health and safety and environmental requirements. Um, to an external organization. And um, it provides uh, auditable documentation, which is helpful when you know, you're know you putting together a, a LEED certification um, uh, dossier. And you can have some documentation to show um, you know, why your products are sustainable. Um, then another shift that we're seeing is that um, when uh, corporate initiatives um, around sustainability uh, the procurement professional um, needs to connect with that initiative. And um, so the sustainability team can say, you know, we want these eco-certified products rather than having to go into much more complex detail of uh, defining that eco-certification. So uh, that's a drive. Um, and, you know, easily to uh, check the box and um, put it into a bid. So limitations um, from uh, the INI perspective are um, I have put into two buckets. Uh, so uh, this slide, which talks about impact, and the um, second slide, which will I'll talk about uh, business um, perspective. Um, so eco certifications are, are a little different from our perspective. Um, many other certifications have kind of become a, a, come about as a consolidation of best practices that kind of already existed on the market. Um, it, it looks to us like eco-certifications are a little bit different in that um, they, these standards have, you know, the stated goal to change market and change customer requirements. So, you know, they're really driving the market in a, uh, a certain direction. Um, but uh, a key question is, um, it's unclear if, um, you know, this is successfully having an impact on the environmental health and safety of an operation. And um, you know, when we look at this, uh, we look at uh, from an I and I perspective. There's uh, you know a cleaning process, cleaning procedure, uh, and it's much more than just pulling a box off the shelf. So um, that's why ours are a bit different than a consumer perspective. And so. I've circled here on this slide it's the environmental health and safety, which is the hand of the lead. Um, but that's only part of the view that we really think is important to have an impact on uh, the EH and F of our customers' operations. Um, human health and safety, of course, is critical, but water, waste, how much energy does that process take? Uh, 
what is the chemistry doing to their assets, like a cooling tower? You know, are we minimizing corrosion? And how about air quality? How about operational safety? So um, a limitation is that um, you know it, you need to take a look at the whole picture to really have an impact. So um, from a business perspective, um, I think I've mentioned this once already, but um, eco certifications are quite regional um, and also have limited categories. I think rightly so that they are um, specific uh, to a certain cleaning application like hard surface cleaning or laundry or wear washing. Um, but um, our business is global. Um, so having a potpourri of regional um, certifications is, makes business quite complex. Um, and then also, uh, we have a broad, broad range of product and applications. And um, it's confusing for our customers a lot of times because if they're looking for eco-certifications, they think any product they buy can be eco-certified and are very confused and they say, no, there's no eco-certification category for a uh, dairy cleaner or you know, some other uh, product category. So um, there's definitely limitations because of the narrow scope of eco-certification. Um, and again, you know, on the theme of narrow, um, most of eco-certifications have um, kind of a consumer product context. So they uh, focus on a product in a package sitting on the shelf. Um, so uh, the eco-certification doesn't take into account uh, the complete view of the product or process or system. Um, and, you know, like closed-loop dispensing, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a, a key component that's used in the I&I &I, uh, industry versus consumer. Uh, there's also uh, brand impact because eco-certifications uh, define um, a you know, broad aspect of product. And so, um, you know, you're putting a lot of trust in a third-party organization um, as far as the, you know, corporate reputation. And finally, uh, the requirements on eco-certifications. Um, you know, each eco-certification is slightly different. Um, and, you know, as you work through getting eco-certified products, you wonder, you know, are these uh, requirements really prioritized as to their impact? You know, so some things that you know, are really hard for us to do. Um, sometimes, you know, you could think, does this really have a big impact? Uh, so it, that would be interesting to um, maybe prioritize by impact. Um, are these requirements founded on solid science um, so that they will have an impact? And then one of the most difficult things for business is um, the changing requirements. So I um, photocopied a um, copy of the um, EPA's BFE, and you can see here in small print, I have to lean forward to look at it, um, but it's revised in 2009, 2010, 2011. Um, so keeping in mind um, a pretty rapid product development cycle is two years um, from the ground up. And, um, you know, this standard is changing every year. So um, it really doesn't match with, um, you know, the product development cycle and, you know, can really be an unknown business risk. So um, the, this slide um, shows uh, a, an innovation for, that's really been a win-win from a sustainability perspective. And um, so on the left, uh, you see um, a, a bucket that would deliver uh, liquid products. And um, one of the key innovations that has really been uh, fantastic for our customers and fantastic for uh, sustainability is uh, basically dehydrating the product. Kind of like paying on the, uh, as, you know, astronauts going to the moon, you dehydrate the product and then reconstitute it with water on site, but using a dispensing system. And um, so we've uh, been innovating around uh, developing uh, solid products uh, for a number of years um, and develop closed loop uh, dispensing systems. So the win is that, you know, you go from 1,250 grams of packaging down to 125 and then, by the way, you can't fill a solid, um, and you go from 60-pound container to 9-pound. Um, then further changing the chemistry, we were able to get down to uh, 7 grams of packaging in a closed-loop dispensing. Uh, but it was only in the very recent um, history 
uh, that the eco-certification bodies started to recognize this, um, you know, sort of via and consumer closed loop dispensing uh, for, uh, because this, of course, dehydrating product uh, means that you have to concentrate it. Um, so uh, now several eco-certification bodies are looking at uh, the closed system and the youth solution, um, which we think makes a, a ton of sense. Um, but uh, eco-certifications weren't driving that innovation. Um, they, they were more a lagging um, of understanding this innovation. So next, a little bit on um, our strategy or the way that we think about eco-certification. Um, we always, as we develop our, our products and systems, um, look at the whole system and lead with performance. Um, so eco-certifications are used, uh, but they certainly don't define our product responsibility or our stewardship ambition. Uh, we don't uh, separate uh, green product lines from everything else because all of our products, we feel, have to be developed with human health and environmental safety in mind. And as the graphic down here uh, shows, uh, we not only look at human health and environmental safety, but really all of the other attributes of a product in action in our customer's location. You know, what is it doing to their water? What is it doing to their effluent? How much energy is it taking? Um, in addition, um, we don't use eco logos or symbols on our product labels um, unless it's required by um, a regulatory agency. Um, we will put uh, the information and the symbols on the collateral, but not on the label. Um, but we do think uh, that eco certification uh, solves some customer problems, and that's what we're all about. Um, so uh, we have globally over 200 SKUs that have been eco-certified. Uh, so this drills down a little bit deeper just to give you a bit of a window into some of the design considerations that go into making, for example, hard surface cleaner. So um, as I mentioned in the last slide, performance is key. So we start with this product must perform and it must be better than either our internal or external benchmark. Um, in this particular case, we wanted to uh, focus on using more renewable materials. Uh, we wanted to have the lowest possible aqua aquatic and acute toxicity, and we wanted the final product to be biodegradable. We wanted uh, low VOCs. We wanted minimal packaging, so that means we were concentrating the product and using a solution system uh, that you see on the right. Uh, we wanted minimal uh, PPEs or personal protection equipment required in using the product. And um, importantly, we wanted it to be fun to use. Uh, we wanted it to smell good, um, feel good, um, not be irritating in any way. Um, so as a result, uh, we came out with a line of hard surface cleaners that um, were documented to having 17% better uh, performance. Um, so we lead, again, with the performance because, you know, that's the, the purpose of our product is to, you know, protect our customers' environment to make sure it's clean, safe, et cetera. And then, by the way, um, they are also eco-certified. Um, so in this particular case, it has green seal and um, USDA bio uh, so That's an example of how we think about eco-certifications in the context of a product development process. So what might be beyond eco-certifications, and, and where do they fit in the landscape? Uh, so our intention is to be a leader in the area of um, product responsibility, product stewardship, you know, with the end goal of freeing our customer with, from risk and worry, which sounds quite lofty, but, you know, we really feel that it's the right way to do business. Um, so along this continuum is, of course, you have to manage risk and comply and communicate with all the important uh, or all the relevant um, human health and safety and hazard uh, standards. Um, you enhance value by taking the total system into account during your development process. And um, along that continuum is certainly eco-certifications um, because they help our customers, you know, solve uh, some complex communication uh, and discussion problems, audit problems, et cetera. Um, so uh, that's kind of the context of seeing where eco-certifications fit in, in the bigger picture from our perspective. Um, and interestingly, um, and I'd be interested if anybody in the audience, um, you know, has any questions on this, but um, we've started to see 
um, uh, a market gap identified and, and some trends toward filling that. And um, what we're seeing is that there's, you know, kind of, I've talked about, you know, foreign plus eco certification. So there's a lot of information out there, uh, but for a procurement professional, um, there's no real framework. How do you connect the dots? How do you pull together all this information uh, to really make the best possible purchasing choices uh, that will have a positive impact in improving the uh, operation and sustainability and safety of your facility. Um, so uh, last year, the uh, Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council uh, was initiated, and we became, um, because we agree that there, there is a need to kind of connect the dots and go beyond, um, you know, these sort of um, you know, one-off random points of greenness. Um, so we became a founding circle, uh, founder circle member of this organization, and uh, the goal, um, and the, we're still in the sort of formative stages, uh, but the goal is to build a framework, um, which I love, uh, in, in leveraging existing information. So our mantra is not to reinvent anything, but to leverage information where available and essentially connect the dots. And uh, so eco-certifications are will certainly be a part of that, um, where they're available and where they add value. Um, and uh, it will be, the vision is to have it more of a, a guidance uh, document, uh, like LEAD, where you get a certain number of points for X, Y, and Z activities. Um, but one thing that's really important to us is that uh, this will really be something where, um, kind of like LEAD, you prioritize and so you attack the most um, impactful um, attributes of your operation first. Uh, you document a baseline, and then you measure improvement or impact so that you really do know that your efforts are uh, improving and having a, a benefit to your operation. So with that, I will hand it over to uh, Ben and uh, then listen until the end for questions. Thank you so much, Lynn. That was a really comprehensive and detailed overview. Um, our next speaker is Ben Bizark. He's the Certification Manager at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, a nonprofit institute that administers the Cradle to Cradle Certified Products Program. Ben, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Lynn, for that presentation. Uh, it was excellent. Um, I am the Certification Manager at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. Um, I'm going to be talking about our um, certification standard, Cradle to Cradle Certification. Um, and I'm going to be giving a bit of a background on what Cradle to Cradle is as a, as a philosophy and as a practice, um, how that turned into a certification program, sort of the history of the certification program, and uh, um, a little bit about what the standard is actually about. Um, but before that, I'm just going to set a little bit of context uh, with a few slides that I put together a couple weeks ago with recent um, news stories. We know that um, chemicals in products are becoming a uh, higher and higher concern for not only uh, government agencies and consumers, but Retailers are stepping into the mix now, um, wanting to know what's in the products that they're selling, and uh, now starting to also say, we want to phase out certain chemicals that haven't necessarily even been um, regulated by governments. They're taking a, a leadership stance in that uh, regard, so knowing what chemicals are in those products is, is important. Um, we know also that we're facing issues with what happens to products at the end of their useful time or after they break. Uh, so in certain circumstances, retailers are having to uh, take back defective product and treat it as hazardous waste or um, you know, potentially face fines if they don't know how to treat it as, as hazardous waste. Um, and for a lot of materials, we don't know uh, what to do with them or we have a difficult time in uh, in figuring out what to, do, what to do, how to dispose of those materials, or how to potentially uh, recycle them. This at the same time that we're facing uh, scarcity with various kinds of resources, not only uh, fuel resources for production, um, but also resources in terms of the raw materials that we use to produce products. 
and also scarcities in things like water, which affects uh, certainly not only industry, but also becomes a human rights issue as we look at uh, scarcity of water around the world and scarcity of, of quality water for drinking um, around the world. So this is just to sort of set the landscape that we live in a world where these issues are connected um, and sustainability strategies, corporate responsibility strategies require us to really be looking at multiple impacts of uh, production and consumption. So we imagine a world in which the concept of waste uh, does not exist, that all um, products at the end of their useful life are, are considered resources um, to go back into systems, where the materials that we use to make those products are uh, safe for the people that are using them and working with them, as well as for the environment, um, or that those materials are used in, appropriate, in an appropriate context. And we also uh, imagine a world in which everything is produced with 100% cleanly renewably, uh, renewable energy. Um, so in other words, we look at a world in which consumption could potentially be a good thing and production could be a positive force. Cradle to Cradle is what led us to this vision. Um, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things is a book that was published in 2002, uh, written by uh, Michael Brongart and William McDonough. And it put out a sort of a, a, a philosophy, a design practice, not just for designing products, but for designing whole systems, for designing uh, cities and um, uh, regions, for just a different way of thinking about the world, uh, a way in which we think about the world mimicking natural cycles. So nature gave us a system of biological nutrients, and nature uh, produces things that can be consumed by other organisms um, and eventually decompose into soil as nutrients for more living systems. Uh, cradle to Cradle introduced this idea of a technical nutrient cycle. So for those things that it's not really appropriate to think about in terms of biodegrading back into soil um, and becoming nutrients, we can think of those things as technical nutrients that can be produced uh, with disassembly in mind from the design stage out of materials that are inherently uh, recyclable. So at the end of their use, they can be disassembled and those materials can go back in as resources, um, what we sometimes call being metabolized into uh, resources for the industrial system again without ever getting into the biosphere. A key component of this is in thinking about um, impacts in terms of uh, effectiveness as opposed to efficiency. So there's a lot that we can do and it is important to be efficient uh, to use uh, resources more wisely, more efficiently, um, to make efficient use of energy those are all very important things, but Cradle to Cradle proposes those aren't necessarily sufficient, that while we are making efficient use of uh, materials and energy, we need to also be making a positive impact. So not just using less energy, but making sure that the energy that we are using is renewable energy, uh, not just using less toxic uh, chemicals, but actually choosing chemicals and designing chemicals um, that are benign or even have a positive impact. Uh, uh, for those that are exposed to them. So this book, Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, was published in 2002. Um, in 2005, MBDC, which is uh, the company that Michael Brongart and William McDonough uh, began, started using a certification mark as a way to denote um, progress or achievement for companies that they had been working with to implement these cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles into their product design. By 2010, this, is, this had gotten um, big enough that uh, MBDC decided to move the certification program to a new uh, nonprofit organization. So the Cradle-to-Cradle -cradle Products Innovation Institute uh, was founded in 2010 to take over um, the certification program, the administration of the certification, and its ongoing development. And that this is, uh, at this time, a new version of the certification standard was developed. Uh, in 2012, the Institute um, formed a certification standards board, which 
is tasked with the ongoing development of the certification standard. We began training uh, assessors. Um, these are the companies that help um, manufacturers to assess their products for certification. Uh, at this point, we've trained uh, an additional 11 assessors, I believe, that are capable of doing this work. Um, and we launched the new version of the, the certification standard, which I'll talk about. So the Institute's role is really to um, guide and facilitate the design of better products, products designed according to these cradle-to-cradle -cradle principles. And the chief way that we do that is through the certification program that we manage. Um, but we also, as I mentioned, train assessors. We accredit assessors that conduct the assessments of these products uh, for certification. And we educate the market about what cradle-to-cradle -cradle means, what it means to be a cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified product, um, and work with um, uh, procurers and other sorts of uh, levers within um, the consumer space as well as in the business-to-business -business space uh, around preferring cradle-to-cradle -cradle certified products. One of our goals is also to identify challenges, as there are many challenges with doing this kind of work, to develop resources uh, to help manufacturers in overcoming challenges to redesigning their products in this way. So one, um, one idea around that is in certifying more building blocks, um, chemicals and materials and otherwise, so that um, designers have more choices of, of certified materials to build their products from the ground up in the first place. The Cradle to Cradle Certification Standard is a continual improvement standard. So we recognize the fact that a company will start um, you know, somewhere along the spectrum. It could be at the basic level, um, doing a, a, you know, a basic amount of work towards Cradle to Cradle design on up to a gold or platinum level product, uh, indicating a significant amount of investment and achievement uh, according to the Cradle to Cradle principles. So for the basic level, um, a basic level product is two years um, before they're recertified and must move up to the bronze level. And after that, some um, amount of optimization or improvement needs to be shown in order to continue with the certification program. The certification program measures products and has a series of um, requirements in five categories. So the first is material health. Uh, the second is material reutilization and design for disassembly, uh, renewable energy, uh, use of renewable energy, water stewardship, and social fairness is the last category. And I'll talk a bit about those in, in more detail in a moment. Within each one of these categories, um, moving from basic to a platinum level, uh, the, the, the process is generally one of inventory assessment and optimization. So the first steps generally being for each one of these categories, a basic inventory of what you have, an energy audit or um, a basic bill of materials of what is in the product. Um, from there, it moves to an assessment of that information. Um, so looking at materials, it's looking at uh, which of those are appropriate materials for uh, that particular product and which ones need to be phased out uh, for energy looking at sources of, of renewable energy versus non-renewable energy. Uh, and then the, you know, the, you could say the final stage, but it's really an ongoing phase of optimization um, where a company is committing to optimizing that pro product over time and again not just becoming more efficient but also um, taking steps to, to create a positive impact. So at the end of this, the company would come out with uh, what we call a scorecard. And uh, each uh, product would be given a level in each of the categories, with the overall certification level being the lowest um, level achieved in, in any one category. So while you may have achieved a gold level in four to five categories, if you had achieved um, just bronze or silver in, say, uh, renewable energy, the overall certification score level of the product um, would be held back uh, to that bronze or silver level. 
which really, um, you know, it, it makes a, a, an equal, um, uh, looks at these, at these categories relatively equally. Some are, are more difficult to, than to achieve, uh, more difficult to achieve than others, but it's not based on a point system in which you could achieve uh, more points in one category to make up for deficiencies in another, which is an important uh, aspect. Um, I'm going to divert quickly here to talk uh, a little bit about how um, certification compares with life cycle assessment. Um, and as Kathleen said earlier, this was originally, um, or this, this uh, track was originally around life cycle assessment uh, versus kind of life cycle impacts more broadly. Um, CTC certification, credit credit certification is not uh, life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment is a formal uh, methodology for, for measuring the impacts of a product um, according to each of its uh, constituent materials from resource extraction, production, um, use phase, and disposal. Um, so there's a significant amount of uh, analysis that goes into that, which starts with setting a scope for a project like that because um, there are it gets complex as you begin looking at a product in that uh, detail throughout the supply chain. So having a, a goal and scope is important. Um, the materials are, are uh, inventoried and uh, impacts are determined either based on primary data, you know, data that's actually collected from the supply chain or oftentimes from databases which aggregate data based on a particular um, uh, material or industry. And that information is interpreted to then provide a, a view of kind of hot spots around the supply chain to determine uh, where you know the most impact can be can be had. Those impacts tend to focus on uh, waste, air um, emissions, and water emissions uh, of products. It's a very quantitative um, style of reporting, um, but as I said, it is based on certain kinds of assumptions and, and certain kinds of um, uh, data um, limitations uh, when dealing with, with secondary data it can be a very useful um, tool for helping to compare uh, impacts of a couple of different uh, alternatives so as not to inadvertently uh, choose an alternative with some greater impact elsewhere in the supply chain. Um, but this uh, this system is, as I said, very helpful, but it's not what cradle-to-cradle certification is, where cradle-to-cradle certification um, begins with is with goals and with uh, an intention to create a product that supports, um, you know, this world that we talked about in the beginning um, that supports these sorts of cradle-to-cradle -cradle values. And an inventory is done um, on the product and the production process to look at where we need to go um, to get this to this kind of product that we want to be. And it does place focus at the initial phases around um, the, the final production um, process, around the materials um, in the product as they are, and their, their um, hazard uh, potential and risk. So it, it doesn't necessarily go into as much of the, the resource extraction, transportation impacts um, through the life cycle of each material at the beginning. However, towards the later um, stages, towards the platinum stage, it does go back into the supply chain in that way. And I'm going to explain a little bit about each of the uh, categories of certification here. So um, it starts with material health, and this is really one of the most challenging uh, components of the certification system. And it begins at a basic level with identifying generic materials that are used in the product and also ensuring that the product does not contain any uh, banned list chemicals. So we have a list of, of chemicals that are banned, which is available on our website at any level of, of certification, um, which largely overlaps with a number of uh, regulatory lists and known bad actors. Um, so it begins with that and continues with an assessment of, of the rest of the product in order to determine how it needs to be optimized. So an assessor will work with a company to identify um, 
all of the formulations in all of the materials in the product down to 100 parts per million of the product. Um, and this process can take a long time depending on the complexity of the product and depending on the relationships of the manufacturer with their supply chain. An assessor can serve an important role of, at times, being able to engage in, in um, separate um, confidentiality agreements with suppliers in order to get those formulations and conduct assessments without necessarily uh, disclosing those actual formulations to a manufacturer. They'd be able to disclose the uh, results of, of an assessment while redacting some of the proprietary information, which can help manufacturers in making decisions and prioritizing um, materials and chemicals for optimization. So a material health assessor would provide an overall uh, assessment for each material in the product um, based on uh, a series of 24, I believe, environmental and human health impacts that are um, related to the chemicals in the product. And these are not dissimilar from other um, hazard rating systems, such as the green screen. Um, there's a relatively similar uh, material health me methodology, which is spelled out in a lot of detail uh, in documents that are available on our website. Um, but an accredited assessor would come out with an assessment which would rate each material according to its health um, or safety profile as well as uh, cyclability profile as either um, an ideal or preferable um, material for a cradle-to-cradle -cradle product, um, moderately problematic, or uh, ex-assessed, which means needs to be phased out. So within the material reutilization component of the certification system, uh, again, it starts at a basic level with identifying the product as, a, as designed for a biological nutrient cycle or a technical nutrient cycle, or both if it's easily, um, if the product is easily disassemblable. Um, then goes into assessing those materials to determine whether or not they are inherently recyclable or biodegradable based on um, the, the application and in optimizing uh, those materials towards um, being recyclable, biodegradable, um, towards use of rapidly renewable content or, um, or recycled content uh, as may be appropriate. And then also towards the higher levels of certification, it looks at the company's role in the take-back uh, system or uh, material management system for that product, so actively participating um, either on their own with uh, third parties or uh, with you know, municipalities and governments to ensure that those materials are appropriately managed. So I have a couple of examples of this. One is um, a, a, a fabric product, a textile product um, produced into uh, workwear for the health um, industry. And uh, so these things are designed out of biodegradable and um, biocompatible uh, chemicals. So the fabrics and um, fibers themselves are certified at the gold level, meaning that they um, everything in there in this particular case is safe to go back into uh, soil. Those are washed, um, used and washed and dealt with a, a specific contractor um, for the maintenance of that apparel through its use time. And after the set number of washings, uh, those things can be safely uh, composted again through this um, specific uh, uh, supply partner. An example of this for the technical nutrient cycle would be, um, in this case, the carpet tile product, which is uh, produced and uh, sold, produced out of inherently recyclable materials once that product is done being used, there's a number on the back you can call to have those um, picked up. Uh, and Shaw or a partner would pick up that product, and they're actually able to um, recover the materials through separation of the plastics that are used and turn um, the backing into um, back into nylon 6, um, or rather into polyolefin. Uh, rather have it go back into um, carpet backing and turn the fibers back into nylon 6, which can be, again, used as fibers and go back into the production process. 
So the program also looks at renewable energy and carbon management. And uh, an important aspect of this is it's not necessarily around the amount of energy use. Um, as we said before, efficiency is an important aspect of this, but what um, the Cradle to Cradle Certification Program really strives for is use of uh, renewable energy sources. So efficiency is certainly a way to lower the overall energy profile to make it um, you know, more achievable to, uh, to purchase renewable energy. Um, but that's really what we're looking for. And in terms of carbon management, it's looking at, again, efficiency using, you know, combusting as little um, uh, fuel on site as possible, but for whatever emissions are um, generated um, to offset those emissions with, with carbon offset projects. So this, again, begins at the beginning with a, a audit process um, to look at various sources of, of uh, or uses of energy within the production process and a commitment to use of renewable energy. And then starting at the silver level, um, uh, increasing uses of renewable energy and increasing um, percentages of, of carbon, on-site carbon emissions offset. Uh, in terms of water stewardship, this requires the company to see um, water as a, as a valuable resource um, that requires effective management. Again, at the beginning level, it's a basic inventory of water uses and, and basic assurance that local water quality um, uh, regulations are met, and then goes into looking at what are concerns for water quality within a particular industry or within a particular region, um, and imposing management issue uh, management strategies to rectify any of those issues. As it goes up in um, certification level, it's also looking into the supply chain, use of water in the supply chain, um, towards an ultimate goal of water coming out of a production process that is as clean or cleaner as it was uh, going in. And within the social fairness category, here again, um, looking at, on a basic level, the, the issues that are, um, that may come up within a particular industry or within a, a particular geography um, and management um, procedures set to rectify those issues, and then moves up towards a, a self um, a self audit uh, for social issues and human rights issues towards um, at the uh, upper stages um, of certification, innovative social product projects that are in place, use of um, other third party labels that are targeted towards um, supply chains and and uh, or particular uh, issues or materials, so looking at FSC or fair trade um, kinds of certifications towards ultimately a um, third party uh, facility level um, social responsibility audits for the production facilities. So in order to get certified, the process really needs to start with the manufacturer committing to it because of the uh, continual improvement aspect of this. It's not something that can just be achieved once and, um, and then, you know, the mark sort of used continuously. The products are recertified every two years, and at those, each of those two-year markers, optimization uh, needs to be shown. A manufacturer would work with uh, an accredited assessor that has been trained and accredited by the institute uh, to collect all of the documentation um, and information uh, for the certification process. As I mentioned before, a big piece of that is in collecting the formulations of um, all the materials in the product. The uh, assessor would then assess all of that information and compile what we call a, an assessment summary report, um, which is not only the material assessment um, of all the materials in the product, but also uh, collates all of the uh, other documentation that was provided to meet the other standards. And that certification report is passed on to um, our organization, the Cradle Cradle Products Innovation Institute, uh, for a final audit of that report to ensure that documentation has been um, uh, provided to meet all of the requirements of the certification. And we provide a, a certification based on that. 
So the certification process um, can really help companies towards the building of safer products, first and foremost by getting a full understanding of the material uh, ingredients of their product, uh, determining what needs to be phased out before uh, a government entity or a you know, customer um, imposes that. Um, because that can be sort of a costly switch to make uh, if you're having to do that under under a pressure situation. So having that full understanding before that happens and being able to take steps to optimize the product um, early can be can be really valuable. Um, the fact that there are a set of benchmarks um, in this process can provide a, a good set of um, you know uh, optimization benchmarks for companies that are looking to improve over time. The fact that this is a multi-attribute standard that looks at a number of different um, impacts associated with uh, production and use of a product makes sure that the, the strategy is not limited to one particular issue, that it sees a range of issues having to do with the production of the pro uh, product. And it provides in this way, really a cohesive uh, strategy around that. So rather than having sort of siloed efforts to deal with different issues, the cradle-to-cradle -cradle philosophy really brings it all together um, in terms of looking at the whole system, in terms of the natural cycle, looking at how various aspects of production um, affect various aspects of, of human health um, and environmental health, and pulling that into a cohesive storyline uh, can be a really important uh, thing for not only employees, um, but also uh, for consumers. The fact that it's a third-party certification program also can provide some assurance and, again, can be used externally um, to show that a uh, product has met certain benchmarks and certain quality criteria. Um, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, with our increasing focus on certifying uh, materials and, and base chemicals, we hope to develop a much larger library that product designers can choose from when designing new cradle-to-cradle -cradle, um, products. So with that, um, that's the culmination of my presentation, but I believe we have uh, a bunch of time for questions. Thank you so much, Ben. That was a really great overview. And there's a lot of um, great material here, um, both from Lynn and Ben. And I'm not seeing any questions yet. So I encourage you to submit your questions. I have a question, Kathleen. This is Lynn. Go ahead. Am I Lynn. unmuted? Nope. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you for that great, uh, those great presentations. And um, I, I have a question for Ben because um, I was, you know, when you talk about social fairness, um, I was wondering whether as part of that you look at, for example, the union status um, and the occupational um, health and safety record of the company and have any parameters that look at, um, you know, health and safety for the workers uh, in terms of the production of the products and the chemicals that go into making those products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I can say from the chemical perspective, um, the, the assessment that is done um, of the materials includes an exposure aspect uh, to it as well. And that exposure piece looks not only at the product in its end use phase, but also um, in terms of potential um, exposure risks that could exist within a production facility. Um, and so, you know, if materials are, are identified that may pose a risk, that is kind of actively um, brought into the, the overall um, the, the management procedures that are identified as being important for that particular um, facility. Um, towards the uh, higher stages of certification process, chemicals also um, become relevant to the the chemical and material assessment as well, um, and those 
same sorts of exposure risks that are looked at um, from a worker's perspective. Um, in terms of the other issues that you mentioned um, around uh, in the facility level um, social issues and company level social issues, we really look to um, some other programs that have um, excelled in this area. So, you know, a, a lot of our social um, responsibility requirements are based on some other programs. So we look towards the, the Global Compact, um, the UN's Global Compact tool, uh, as well as um, B Corp and uh, SA8000 are examples of some of the programs that we look to for their uh, criteria for auditing uh, social um, impacts. So the assumption is that if the product is made to be um, reduced to its, its um, bi biological nutrients, as you were showing in the slide, that there aren't emissions or anything from the original production of it that would be of concern to the neighboring community um, and you know that the um, within this within the boundaries of course of confidential information that the community would be aware of what was if, if they were interested would be able to know what was what you know what uh, what kinds of exposures they had and I, you know I was also interested just beyond exposure in terms of um, non-hazardous uh, chemicals that were created in terms of these products as well, going back to be before exposure, but just to um, creation of the chemicals. But thank you very much. Yeah. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ben. So we have a question here. Um, thanks for two great talks. You both talk about the different metrics of greenness, for example, greenhouse gas emissions, water use, different kinds of toxicity, et cetera. Managing the trade-offs is hard. Do you find that customers are more concerned about some compared to others? For example, has the climate change issue overshadowed issues of chemical toxicity? Or are they mostly concerned with maximizing their rating on the certification scheme? Kind of a long question, but I hope you got the gist of it. So Ben, yeah. do you want to start or do you want me to start? Um, I, I can uh, give, uh, you know, my perspective on that. Um, okay. That, you know, I think that um, from what I'm seeing, um, the, it's, a, it's a mixture. <laughs> um, and I, I'm seeing that a lot of um, the, the chemical impacts are becoming more, um, sort of relevant, um, or they're just getting a little bit higher um, degree of scrutiny at this point. Um, certainly, the, the climate impacts are, are still important um, and, and will continue to be important. But I've noticed that, um, you know, like with Target and, and Walmart requiring the phase out of, of certain chemicals um, with um, things like lead picking up in their, their new version of their certification standard um, materials has become uh, a focus and choosing products for the built environment um, that, are, that are made out of, out of uh, chemicals that are, that are appropriate um, for, for what they're being used for in terms of the impacts on uh, the quality of life of occupants of buildings. Um, that has been a pretty big step. Uh, that they have taken towards recognizing material health as a as a real issue, and um, I think a lot of you know sort of families and and mothers and thinking around sort of development uh, developmental issues. There's another sort of lever that's um, pushing on companies thinking about the the chemicals in their products. So that's a big thing. Um, my answer would be, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, I was just going to say my answer would be um, the same too. I think that uh, you know it's this complex topic, and um, so 
uh, our customers' concerns are mixed. But um, you know, I think most everybody starts out with what's personal, what's affecting me, what am I touching, what am I using, and um, you know, I think that's um, one thing that really drives the interest in the um, human health and safety of, of chemistry. Um, now that said, on the other side, uh, I think corporations are, um, you know, we all want to be in business um, in a clean, healthy world for a long period of time. And you know, I think there is, uh, despite the, the latest uh, Green Biz um, uh, report that came out, I think it was last week, um, I think there is really trends toward um, big corporations and certainly many of our corporate customers for making, um, you know, real, you know, not just talking point, but real commitments to uh, managing their carbon emissions, managing their water. Um, you know, and I, I think that's going to get stronger and stronger. I have uh, relatives that live in California, and you know, let me tell you, water shortages are getting very real out there. And um, you know, so I think that side is also becoming more and more um, salient to people. Thanks, Lynn. So here's a related question for you, Lynn. Um, obviously, a lot of Ecolab's products are business-to-business -business products because um, you're selling your products to them. Uh, how important is your reputation as a leader in sustainability, um, less so for, for direct consumers, but more in terms of the businesses that you sell your products to? Um, critically important. Um, our whole um, identity really is in um, offering our customers solutions to help them be more sustainable. Because uh, several years ago, when we really stepped back and thought, you know, how do we thoughtfully and strategically approach, um, you know, sustainability? You know, uh, we looked at our own operations, and you know, within our operations of manufacturing chemistry. Um, you know, we could only make um, small changes to reduce water, save energy, um, reduce effluents, et cetera. Uh, but where we realized we could have a, just a um, dramatic and, you know, significant exponential impact is um, by thinking about the way that we design our products and systems. So if you think about it, any time that um, we reduce a packaging, like I showed in the solid slide, um, you know, it always still, even though it's been years and years, gives me goosebumps to think, what if we never um, reduced packaging for our solid products and we were, um, you know, recycling or sending all those uh, drums to landfill? Um, so what we realized, and that's why we have engaged with um, and really are uh, very supportive of uh, Cradle to Cradle product design, um, but we see it as you got to think about that and not just one product, but in the way you design all your products. Uh, so, um, so we take that into account in really everything that we look at, and um, I sort of lost my train of thought now in <laughs> answering that question. No, I, th I think you answered it. That um, you know, obviously, EcoLab it's, it's very important to your um, vision as a company and and your brand and to the businesses that you sell to. Yeah, um, and from so, our customers. Yeah. So I uh, have a question for Ben, and again, I encourage folks to submit your questions to us here. Um, we, you talk about the uh, the technical cycle, which is part of the Cradle to Cradle framework, and um, could you talk a little bit about how important product stewardship is to that technical cycle? Um, we know that product stewardship has made great inroads in terms of uh, electronics. But uh, and you use carpet as an example, but um, how how does that kind of fit in, and, and how might policy support uh, so some of those uh, recycling of these technical contaminants? Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. I think that um, policy is is a critical um, aspect of of producer responsibility and of ensuring that the appropriate incentives are in place to make sure that these materials can be reclaimed. Um, you know, it, it takes, um, for a company that's producing a product and, and you know, as has been the case for, for a long time, is manufacturing a product designed 
um, to perform for a certain period of time or you know certainly in some cases designed to um, to uh, work for a limited period of time before it needs to be replaced by something else um, and having no incentive um, to think about what happens to that product after it has been used um, has been pretty pretty detrimental. Um, so have, certainly having um, extended producer responsibility um, policies in place that provide the right kinds of incentives for, for companies to think about what's going to happen to those products and um, participate in, in their uh, recycling is, is really important. Um, you know, I've seen also examples, you know, the, the shaw carpet is one example, um, but there is a growing um, example within the textile industry um, of third parties stepping up as as organizations that are that are building their whole business on the waste stream itself. Um, so in this case, thinking about uh, textiles and a company called iCollect, um, which collects all sorts of textiles, some of which are you know in good condition and are and are resold and and uh, reused that way. Um, but they're working with companies to figure out what are the best, what are the sort of maximally um, valuable products that they can produce out of these and what is the potential of producing more valuable products by redesigning uh, the textiles themselves from the ground up. So they've done some cool work with um, Puma um, and they're working with uh, H&M and, and some other big retailers as well now um, as a company whose business model is, is really built on this. So I think while policy is, is really important, um, there are also some big opportunities for um, companies to get in to this whole reclamation um, space, and uh, certainly in in the uh, in Europe, uh, the circular economy movement has identified a lot of ways um, in which the you know we could get a lot of value out of the economy by looking at uh, waste streams not as waste but as as potential materials streams. Um, and that was a big topic at the World Economic Forum at Davos this year, and will be really interesting to see what kind of models that come up um, that are not just spurred by um, uh, policy, but that you know come out of the industry itself as ways to recapture value from these kinds of materials. Yeah, I think that's a really good comment, Ben, because um, I think there's exciting opportunities for uh, businesses to work together and collaborate in, um, you know, ways that, you know, really haven't been thought about before, um, and even competitors. Um, one of my associates told me the other day that um, sort of an instance of, I think it was Tropicana orange juice. Um, they were, you know, hauling stuff to the East Coast, and they used to be, you know, doing a return load with empty trucks, but um, they um, found that one of their competitors had a finished product that needed to be salt, um, sent back to the West Coast. So. Uh, two competitors were actually um, working together to minimize, um, you know, greenhouse gases essentially, but also saving money by not sending an empty truck back. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's all kinds of opportunities, you know, for not only for end of life, but for, you know, other kinds of collaboration to uh, reduce waste. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So we. We have another question here. Um, how do you identify which of the major life cycle impacts um, that you're going to focus your efforts on? And that was for both Lynn and Ben. I'll let you start, Ben. Oh, OK. Um, well, from our perspective, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's really uh, you know, an across the board kind of thing. You need to be taking steps. Um, with regard to multiple impacts. That being said, um, a focus of the work that we do has always been on material health and, and design stage uh, sorts of solutions. And so, you know, in this world where, where uh, materials are continuously cycled, it's important that those materials are uh, safe materials. We don't want nasty, toxic things necessarily. Um, being cycled over and over again, um, unless 
you know, for example, if there's some kind of a, a reclamation system that ensures in no way it gets into the environment, thinking of some of the sort of interesting solvent uh, leasing programs and things like that. Um, uh, but for the most part, we do not want um, nasty things circulating throughout um, throughout our economy and throughout the production cycle. So it is focused uh, very much on making sure that we're making the right choices um, on a materials level for um, materials and chemicals that are going to be safe for the people that are uh, using them um, and the environment in which they're being used. Um, but that being said, it, you know, again, our certification program says you not only need to make that effort, but also need to be making these other efforts um, with regard to the other criteria in the program. Then um, my answer from the I and I perspective would be um, you probably, if you sit back and think about it, um, everything we deliver, almost without exception, is delivered in a water system. And um, so you'll notice if you look at any of um, you know Ecolab collateral, uh, our focus is uh, minimizing water impact, saving water, um, you know, providing you know the best possible effluent. Um, so uh, the way that you know we identify that water is a key impact to focus on is because you know we just merged with Nalco, who has a huge water process surface uh, service, and uh, so. Things that have uh, made them successful are minimizing the amount of water that you need to use um, in managing a cooling tower. Um, so, for example, um, and this is just uh, you know reducing the amount of chemicals that you have to put in, but you know reducing the chemicals, re reducing the number of times you have to flush the cooling tower um, makes a big difference in uh, running a building efficiently and uh, minimizing the use of water. So, uh, the way that we you know, choose to focus on the impact um, is the impact that impacts our customers in our customers' business. Thank you. So um, here's a here's a good question. Um, first of all, thanks for the great introductions to eco certifications and the uh, cradle to cradle labor. Ben mentioned that um, the cradle to cradle can serve as a liaison between certification customers and their suppliers which is a great reminder of how difficult it can be for some companies, particularly small companies, to get product ingredient information from their supply chains. Could you comment on the willingness or unwillingness of suppliers to participate in these certification processes and how small companies could best engage their supply chains in their environmental initiatives? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it certainly varies greatly um, in terms of how difficult that process is and, and tends to be uh, more difficult in terms of what I've seen for um, smaller uh, customers to get this kind of information from their supply chain. Um, what we have seen in certain circumstances is that, you know, a supply chain that has um, provided, been forthcoming with this information um, has found an opportunity to set themselves apart um, for other customers as well. So while some suppliers have actually gotten their products certified as a result of participating in the process for uh, you know, a later stage and then manufacturer, um, and then seeing that maybe there was some valuable, uh, value in selling the product to, to uh, other manufacturers based on this new information they had about the materials and their product um, and things like that. Um, you know, for, for us, that's, that's a really good uh, sign that there, you know, maybe is some demand not just by the end users of the products, but also um, by the manufacturers to find suppliers that have this information and are willing to share it in some, uh, some respect. Um, you know, I would say now that there are so many companies asking for this information, um, it may be more the, the focus, I guess, might be shifting to some extent from, um, you know, willingness to share this to maybe now having so many 
uh, customer is requiring this information or or, or um, asking for it, that they you know trying to keep up with it all and trying to have a consistent way in which to report out um, is becoming I think a problem with uh, certain suppliers um, that I've heard of. Um, so I think as more manufacturers demand it, and certainly as the targets in the Walmarts of the world um, demand to know what's in their products, it's going to become uh, more of a standard protocol for suppliers to be able to share some amount of information in, in some way. Um, and I think that having that um, that market force on it is really what's going to create a system in which there there is more access to that. Great. So it's it becomes more of a question of a necessity that you have to figure out how you're going to report these things because the demand is increasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Maybe so, Lynn had other uh, thoughts on that too. <laughs> yeah. Lynn, do you um, want to add anything? Uh, well, I don't really have that much to add. I know, um, you know, from you mentioned earlier, we're B two B, and you know, we also have the the same task of getting information from our suppliers. And you know, I can just agree with Ben that it's true. Um, some of the big suppliers are, you know, quite forthcoming with information when we request. Some small suppliers are not so much. Um, however, uh, we did have kind of interesting experience in this. Some of the big suppliers. Um, we're a little difficult to deal with is like, well, do you want parts per million, parts per trillion? You know, tell us exactly <laughs> what you want. You know, <laughs> so uh, it's it's definitely a lot of work. Well, um, I definitely want to thank uh, Lynn and Ben for your fabulous presentations. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise, and we appreciate your leadership in green chemistry. Um, we have to wrap up now, but I've got a couple of really brief announcements. Okay, so um, first of all, everyone who participated in the webinar will receive a resources guide that um, basically outlines a lot of the tools that are available, uh, some of the tools we highlighted in our webinar and the workshops that we conducted prior to this. Um, as well as additional tools that we weren't able to feature, but the resources guide will be mailed to um, all of the registrants. You should be receiving that soon. And finally, we encourage businesses to um, look into joining the Safer Chemistry Challenge program. This is a program that is also um, funded through a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative grant. The Pollution Prevention Roundtable um, is managing this program. And basically, it's designed to motivate, challenge, assist, and recognize facilities um, that are setting goals to reduce toxic chemicals of concern in the Great Lakes, um, chemicals that are affecting our environment and human health. And Cindy McComas is the contact, and you can see her information on the screen. Um, you can get more information also at their website, which is also listed on the screen. But we'll be sending you. Um, a follow-up email with this information. And we encourage you to look at this and consider joining the Safer Chemistry Challenge Program. Um, and again, um, that concludes our webinar. And again, thank you to, to Lynn and Ben for their great presentations. And thanks all of you for participating. Thank you. Thank you.